that, that I was wanting each of you uh, to briefly talk about. And, and that's someone who's, who's a journalist and an outsider in, in, or a layperson in this respect. I was wondering when you when you talk, for example, Scarlett was was talking about the sheer optimism and the, the great you know spirit was there. Could you perhaps each of you talk about give an example of how that integration worked? Um, ben, you talked about projects in Oldham and Alaska. Could you give me a sense of how this changes the lives and experiences of individuals? Just a just a short example. Um, Scarlett, do you want to, to go first? Yeah, happy to. Um, I mean, I think on, on the level of the kind of more, should we say, more classic integration activities, the, the amazing thing that were, that were going on in the region when I was speaking to people was actually quite simple things like regular communication being set up between the head of the STP, the head of the CCG um, and the head of the Public Services Board. Um, and these leaders of what had previously been organisations that might battle about who is going to spend the budget over X person's healthcare suddenly all became collaborative bodies working together with the overall aim of making sure everybody was safe. Um, and so you had this kind of North Star of, OK, we're all here to make sure that people are safe. And so if we all agree that we're here for the same reason, and no one's necessarily the expert on dealing with this because we have this huge uncertainty, then we just need to regularly communicate and work out how we are collectively going to achieve health across the people that we care for. And that as a kind of individual, we need to respond to a pandemic is of course one thing, but it's the same mission as it would be if your if your organizations that are responsible for the health, the health and care of the people that you look after. So that kind of mission building and, and regular communication um, was really, really strong. Um, on a kind of uh, more individual sort of people or organization perspective, I think there was a lot, again, this kind of answer is local, um, we saw really strongly. So the most successful volunteering schemes, the most successful support networks that were built during that time was, you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody on this call was in a kind of mutual aid group that was set up via WhatsApp with the people in your street, you know, you may still be in that WhatsApp group. And of course, there's not as much going on. But the, the wellspring of people taking care of each other and and identifying needs within the community and drawing on the voluntary sector and the local councils, and knowing who in the street might need more care because we know people's age and demographics and we know about their lives. So by contrast, the, the nationally brought in NHS government centralised volunteer scheme delivered almost no care on the ground. So there was kind of a really clear message that actually the most effective um, programmes would be those with, that were delivered at a local level. And I think that's something that we can, we all experienced within our own areas. So I think that, you know, just a couple of examples there of where it, it just happened because there was suddenly clarity over what was needed to be done. The project. And that sounded very exciting in a kind of structural sense, you know, close down this and set up this and so on. But could you give me uh, some examples, human level examples of what differences it made to individuals? Let me tell you about Oldham instead of Alaska, Patrick, if that's all right, because it has a stronger social, uh, social care dimension. So in Oldham, the lead GP, John Patterson, described to me having a young mother come into his surgery um, with anxiety and depression. And she put a letter down on the table from the housing authority explaining that she hadn't paid her rent and was about to lose her flat. And she put another letter down from the school saying her children um, were misbehaving um, and failing to attend school and they were about to lose their places. So the GP spent the evening writing letters to the school and the housing association saying, if you boot her out of her flat, if you kick her kids out of school, you will turn a crisis into a tragedy. But he realized that this was not sustainable. He needed to find a better way of getting to these underlying social issues and breaking this ridiculous cycle where people come into health services with social problems and end up with pills um, to, to palliate the effects. 
Um, so that was what led them to hire their first social worker who went and worked intensively with this mother and family to fix problems of addiction, domestic violence, um, uh, managing their finances and get their lives back on track. And it's a perfect example of how if we combine rather than keeping health and care separate, we can really start using our resources effectively and get to the real problems that are causing ill health and unhappiness. Um, James, uh, if, if if I could bring you in there, we just heard from Ben how you know such a holistic system would work for yeah. for certain individuals. Um, James, um, can you see that uh, kind of approach um, working at all in the current setup, or do you think we need to quite radically change things around, James? I think we'd have to remove some barriers, some of which are practical, some of which are cultural. My example during the summer of um, brilliant partnership and integrated working would be um, eradicating rough sleeping. The, the, the simplicity of the message, eradicate rough sleeping and the alignment of the message, this rough sleeping is dangerous for people, for the community uh, because of COVID, uh, you know, led to an interventionist integrated wrapped around the individual, made a real difference to those people. Um, it, it meant providing people with housing, but also with health services for the first time for many of those people were able to get access to health services that had been denied them because of uh, what my professionals might have called a, a willingness to engage or an unwillingness to engage suddenly removed because of a very different way of thinking about integrated approaches. But to do that, we had to abolish the rules. We had to give executive agency to without governance and without resource making decisions. So I think I think if we're to pursue this, the opportunities here, we do need some um, radical permission to be given for uh, communities and for leaders to take and redesign services. In, in the past, I've done work with Nesta and the Rapid Results Institute about this notion of in 100 days, could you virtually create a new organization and make a radical difference? Um, and we sort of, this was an experiment during COVID for us to do that. It's led to very impressive results. But will we have the energy and the permission to replicate that post COVID or will we go back to our governance? Seems to me to be the key question. Thanks indeed. On that, just picking you up on that issue of governance, you mentioned that before. Uh, we've had our speakers mention about culture. There are different cultures in local governments and the NHS. There are big differences in funding as well. It seems uh, NHS, for all kinds of good political reasons, get lots of money. What I see in local government is social care. Local government has been losing lots of money over the last few years. Um, how do you align those things in any future organisation, uh, particularly when you have the NHS, which is very much a sort of managed, centrally controlled organisation, and local government, which of, of course is is a, is a sort of local, democratically uh, controlled. Uh, in theory, organisation. How do you align all these things? It's a great question. I'll jump in, not because I have an answer, but because I agree it's a difficult question. Um, I suppose the other the other thing that came up in some of our interviews as well, Patrick, when we were speaking to them, is not just the funding um, differences, but that the NHS parts were allowed to be overdrawn and in debt and the council weren't, which, again, not only created this kind of, it, it creates a real funding barrier for the local authorities, but also a real tension between the two sides about who is, who is you know, the local authorities are emptying their own bins because they are so short of money, whereas the NHS NHS are always allowed to be overspent and of course every part of the system is is struggling with a lack of oxygen but actually we really kind of in the work honed in on that actually a lack of funding is is 
is almost as much a cultural barrier as it is a real time, you know, how do we make sure funding gets to the right places is, is, a, is a more a kind of a governance or a structural issue, whereas, you know, how do you create a culture whereby funding is not the first question that comes out of your mouth in every meeting, who's going to pay for this is every single answer. Um, so uh, that's kind of just more, more part of the problem rather than the solution. Um, really, the only thing kind of we ended up centering on and, and part of the work of this, the, this commission was obviously to also look at the potential for a devolved approach to health and social care within this region so whilst it wasn't a full integration across the whole country it was looking at you know what would it look like to have one budget that was allocated um, um, and centrally for this particular region um, and whilst we didn't get into the structures of how that should work or how how funding should be allocated the big message really for us is that you you can only do that if the overall aim is to ensure that funding gets as close to the service provider as possible. Again, emphasizing this idea that it's actually about making sure that funding funding flows as close to the person, as close to the to, to the to the service, as close to the local as you possibly can. Now, not being an expert in, in, in funding structures, we didn't get into what that might look like in kind of you know the nitty-gritty practice. But again, there's an idea about well, it's not just about well, one budget that can be allocated from a central repository. Centralization and money up is not the solution centralization and money and funding down is the solution um and and that kind of principle underpinned a lot of this question about how do you try to think about how you might you might have funding done in some kind of centralized way um ben if i could bring you in on these big questions of culture governance funding in effect two different funding systems and also you have um, within social care, you have lots of private providers who have um, uh, their own motivations around uh, making a profit or at least not making a loss. How do you balance all these uh, things? How, let me answer, I think I can answer that last question. How do we fit private providers into the system? Um, I mean, we need to create partnership arrangements that will work for lots of different organizations and we need to have models that allow us to move money around these systems. Um, I don't see any problem in having private profit making providers at the table and, and making those partnerships work. But I think they have to, I think we probably need to move to block grant arrangements across most of the providers within these systems open book accounting so that we can see where profits and losses are going. And we need to be able to take money from one part of the system to another. Now, there are arrangements in the world that can manage that, even when you have private profit making providers at the table. And the best example I know is, is Canterbury, New Zealand. Um, it's a slightly different model to the traditional contracting model we're used to with private providers, where we say, if you do well, you'll make a big profit and take it away. If you do badly, you'll absorb your losses. You might go bankrupt. I don't think that model fits very easily in these systems that we're developing. I think we probably need a group of providers, private, public, social enterprise, who are gonna be in it in the long term. We will protect everybody's viability, but nobody's gonna make a massive profit. Um, James, would you would you like to to come back on this, particularly uh, this idea of how private providers fit into uh, into a model of integration and what what the, the what the limits are on what their contractual limits are, um, and um, you know how do you draw up a contract uh, for someone who is delivering services as part of a holistic system. Uh, sorry, is James there? Yeah, James, you're on mute. You're there. Animated. I am, sorry, I'm, I'm muting. Sorry. Uh, I've got connectivity plus my own competency issues going on. Um, so I, I think um, I think it's essential to bring providers per se into the integration debate uh, locally. And whether they're for profit or whether they're not for profit uh, seems to me to be a secondary question. Pro our providers in social care know much more than 
social services and social workers, in fact, about the, 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 the conditions, as it were, and the support arrangements for individuals. They're a key part of the equation. But it seems to me the, the question behind that is, would will providers um, invest in a changed way of working and a more choice-based and more controlled way of working for the people that they're serving? And what is the model that best serves that? Um, if we were to move to a block contracting model, for example, would that um, improve choice and control for individuals who are wanting to map their own uh, support journey, sometimes over 20, 30, 40 years, not just, not just uh, as it were, the traditional image of social care as someone in, someone in a residential home. So you've really got to think about this from a user uh, point of view, not just, uh, not just the problem of profit, as it were. Um, there's a similar problem uh, of people and their own uh, capital and resources that they bring as well, which is a question of how do you motivate people to bring, bring their resources into the equation? You know, strengths-based social work is about that agenda as well. So I, I think it's essential that we pull providers in. I, I, I think we've got to lose the worry about um, profit and, and um, focus more on regulation and the ethics of how businesses are run. James, thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in now um, from the audience and um, a bewildering amount. So I'm just going to go through as I 